Good evening. <laughs> My name is Russ Brown. I'm the Chief Accountability Officer for Baltimore County Public Schools. And I want to welcome you to Perry Hall High School and thank you all for participating in this process. Um, we, uh, as a community, appreciate your efforts and, and the time that it takes uh, to go through this process and the energy that it takes to go through this process and devote and attention to be able to do this and do it well. We're getting ready to kick off a process and there are a couple of things I want to get out in front of uh, before we kick it off and, and, and get moving. One, this process involves your community as a whole. And so one of the things that we're going to ask you to do and we're going to repeatedly ask you to do is to try your best to put aside your interest solely for your school and to think instead about the community as a whole and how best to make use of the additional seats that are going to be afforded by this new Northeast Elementary School and how those seats can be best used to relieve overcrowding in the region as a whole. The objective in the end is to try to balance enrollment across schools. The team will go through Rule 1280 and some of the criteria we use as a committee to think about that process and to help shape our thinking as we move through it. Again, I know it's hard, but I would ask that you step back a little bit, work with your colleagues and your other com uh, community members, and try to come up with a solution that's best for the community as a whole. We know change is hard. Every time we go through this, um, it, it, you know, people feel very, very strongly about their schools. I know people in the Perry Hall community love their schools. We hear it all the time. Uh, you guys have wonderful schools across the board, but change is hard, and we're asking people to change. And we have to respect that when we're asking people to change, that's not an easy thing to do. And we can fully expect that some folks are not going to be happy with some of the decisions that are made by the uh, committee which is why it's so important for us to be respectful, listen to one another, and try to think about what's best for the community as a whole. That being said, we've got a couple special guests this evening uh, that I want to have uh, take a moment to introduce. We have uh, two of our board members who took time out of their schedules to come here, and I think they both wanted to give welcoming, welcoming remarks. We have uh, Ms. Julie Henn and Mr. Stephen Birch. <laughs> so Ms. Henn, I, I know you wanted to say a couple things. Good evening, everyone. I'll keep my remarks brief. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Julie Henn. I'm an at-large member of the Board of Education. I was appointed in December, and I'm a Perry Hall resident, lifelong resident. My children have gone through Seven Oaks Elementary, Chapel Hill Elementary, and my daughter's currently at Perry Hall Middle in seventh grade. I'm proud to serve you on the board. I'm thankful for your service on this committee and just want to thank you for your time and effort. Have a good evening. Thank you. And our resident folk uh, who just recently got through another boundary process, Mr. Stephen Burt. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Brown. I want to thank all of you for volunteering your time. Uh, as you heard me, I'm Steve Virch, and um, Barbara and I have lived for 20 plus years just behind Casamillas. So after a boundary meeting with Victory Villa, and I'd be pretty hungry, I would go over to Casamillas. Uh, but I want to thank you again for all of your service. Uh, Julie and I, while we are on the board, we are just observers in this stage of the process. This is about the hard work that you'll be doing and the recommendations that you will be making. Um, you've heard all the other advice. It's time to get to work. Uh, should you see Julie or I, we're happy to talk with you. But again, we're just observers. Uh, the district I represent includes students who come to our Perry Hall schools and we all want the best for our Perry Hall schools and our other schools because Oakley is also participating in this process. So I'll let you all get to work. Good luck. Here we go. And now we're going to hand things off to Matt Cropper, who will describe a little bit about his experience and start to walk us through the process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And thank you all for coming and uh, participating in this process. Um, your role in this process is very important and we really look forward to uh, working with you as we, as we work to provide a recommendation on, for boundaries in this area. Before we get started and before I start talking about myself and, and so on and so forth, I think it would be good to, for us to do some introductions. And basically, if you could just tell us who you are and maybe a school that you're affiliated with or something like that, and that would be fine, then you can hand the mic to the next person. Um, so we'll start over here and we'll work our way around. 
Uh, John Kantorski at uh, Chapel Hill Elementary. Parent. I'm a parent. Um, I'm Felicia Cunningham from Seven Oaks Elementary. Amy Holland, parent representing Kingsville Elementary School. Danielle Ellis, um, fourth grade, Jabbaville Elementary. Good evening. I'm Charlene Benke, principal of the new Northeast Elementary. I'm Megan Davis. I'm a teacher from Gunpowder Elementary. Chris Burley from Vincent Farm Elementary, parent. Barbara McLennan, principal at Kearney Elementary. And I'm Donna Bergen, principal at Perry Hall Elementary. Kim Price, and I'm a teacher at Kingsville Elementary. Lisa Norton, parent, Gunpowder Elementary. Catch our two parents, the folks that walked in. Sharon Mason, principal at Oakley Elementary. Nakia Humphrey, parent at Oakley Elementary. Carol Wingard, principal at Seven Oaks Elementary. Meg Dalatezza, teacher at Oakley Elementary. Johnny Huntley, principal at Chapel Hill Elementary. Nicole DePietro, parent from Kearney Elementary. Tiffany Stith, co-chair for Northeast Advisory Council. Laura Graves, grandparent from Chapel Hill Elementary. Christina Payne, parent from Perry Hall Elementary. Anne Marie Martinelli, I'm a teacher at Perry Hall Elementary. I'm Nitsa Zadera, and I'm a parent from Chapel Hill Elementary. Angie Feely, parent from Kingsville Elementary. Wendy Cunningham, principal, Gunpowder Elementary School. Stephen Bender, principal, Vincent Farm Elementary School. Leslie Zink, parent from Gunpowder Elementary. Belinda Tataris, Principal Job of You. Victoria Lucky, Classroom Teacher at Seven Oaks Elementary. Kathy Allen, Parent, Vincent Farm Elementary. Claire Velton, Teacher at Kearney Elementary. Janine Kohler, Teacher at Vincent Farm Elementary. Nicole Herr, Payton, uh, Parent at Job of You Elementary. Nicholas Hollingsworth, Parent at Perry Hall Elementary. Kelly Horvath, Special Educator at Chapel Hill Elementary. Carol Ferris, Principal, Kingsville Elementary. Sheena Bittner, uh, Parent at Kearney Elementary. Okay, so um, my name is Matthew Cropper. I am with Cropper GIS Consulting, and we are a K-12 planning firm that, uh, out of Ohio, actually. But we do work with school districts all over the country, and we specialize in, in work just like this, the boundary studies and school redistricting and things like that. And I'll t I think I'll talk a little bit about myself on a slide here. But um, before I get started, everybody on the committee should have picked up, uh, when you signed in, you should have picked up a binder. So everybody should have a binder on them. And in that binder, there is also uh, copies of the materials, and you'll be getting new materials every at the beginning of every meeting, so make sure you get that. Um, there's also a copy of the PowerPoint in the binder in case you have a difficult uh, time read, reading the, the screen. I know that's some distance away for some, from some people. Feel free to follow along in the, um, in, uh, from the materials in your binder. But our goals tonight are to um, give you, uh, familiarize you with the background report. So there's some materials in your, as I mentioned, in the binder that just for starters to give you uh, some background information about this area. And I'll talk a little bit about that and give you some orientation on that. Um, we'd like to establish and begin practicing norms for committee engagement. So, um, so we are going to um, go through a couple of exercises uh, for you to, um, to get familiar with, with each other and, and do something what we call an opportunities analysis that lets you evaluate uh, some of the opportunities and things like that and um, evaluate the, the nature of this, of this process and some things that we may, may uh, need to be mindful of. And finally, uh, I'm gonna talk about planning blocks and uh, everybody, every group has a set of maps in front of them and one of those maps are planning blocks and we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have the committees work in small groups to look at those planning block shapes and the boundaries of the planning blocks and kind of give us your initial uh, uh, gut reaction on those planning blocks and uh, give you the opportunity to mark them up and tell us if any, any adjustments should be made to those uh, on a preliminary basis. 
So a boundary change, we are in the midst of a boundary change study, and that's why everybody is here around, around the table. Um, a boundary is a line that defines a school attendance area. So in Baltimore County Public Schools, it's guided by policy and rule 1280, which are board approved policies and rules established by the school board that help define uh, what the rules to follow if, you, if boundary lines need to be adjusted. And so we will be reviewing that policy 1280 here tonight, and I'll be reviewing it again in other meetings. But basically what you need to do is focus on if a boundary line, in terms of making a boundary line adjustment, you always need to ask yourself, does it bring us closer to adhering to the overall Rule 1280 and the overall considerations and criteria that we are focused on? The process is facilitated by an independent consultant, which is myself, um, and is driven by a community-based committee of uh, principals, teachers, and parents, which is all of you. And so this is a, an open and transparent process, and we, we, that's the best way to do this, and so that not only the committee is aware of things that are going on, but all this information is shared publicly, it's being live streamed, all, we, we do everything we can to make sure that this is an open and transparent process as possible and that public members are able to follow the process as well. Even if they can't be here, if they're working late and this and that, they can go online and download all these materials and they can follow the process as well. Um, really, the, this process involves an objective examination of data, um, creation of options. So we're going to be starting in, at the next meeting starting into the options development and looking at how many different ways boundaries can be drawn and um, in just engagement with with you, you this committee as as a group but then also extending that out to the community as a whole um, and then finally with the end goal of providing a recommendation to the board of education which then it goes into their hands and then the the, the board of education uh, your, your role is complete at that point once you provide a recommendation to the board um, even when you get to that point, everything is draft and nothing is finalized until it is approved by the board. So, um, but we have, a, we have a good, a lot of ground to cover. I, as I said, we are a Cropper GIS Consulting um, and we do this work all over the country. And uh, my name is Matthew Cropper and you'll see me at all of the meetings and things and I'll be happy to help answer any questions that you have. Um, and uh, yes, and we've, done, we've done a lot of work in Baltimore County. We've probably done five or six different boundary studies across the county for this district, but we've worked in Frederick, uh, Richmond Public Schools in Virginia, and um, all over the U.S. So we bring not only um, our, ex uh, we, we bring objectivity and uh, expertise in terms of technology and being able to give you maps and data and accurate information statistics, but we also bring uh, a good, well-rounded experience in what has and hasn't worked in communities all across the United States. And so, and so, and we, we come as an objective third party. Uh, we don't have a stake in the game. We don't have any kids in the system. And so we really come here from, a, from, from that standpoint. Uh, as a committee, um, you are here to represent each school community, but as Dr. Brown said, your role is, is not, not only to, to, to look at what's, uh, what's best for the school or the area that you live in, but you really need to focus on what's best for uh, the best plan that, that meets the needs of all students in this area. Not just the needs of one particular school, one student, or one, or one neighborhood, but really the best plan is going to be one that meets the needs and the best plan for all kids in this entire, entire area. Um, you will be meeting six times from September through December and you'll be working together and, um, and it, as I said, presenting this, re your recommendation to the Board of Education. So on page four of your background report, you'll see a timeline. So everybody, uh, if you can, just mark your calendars on the, the dates and times for these meetings. I believe all of the meetings are scheduled to be held here from six to eight p.m. And so, um, and so we will, uh, if, if, if that does change, we'll certainly let you know. And let us know if you're unable to attend any meetings just so that we can track attendance. We also have uh, Miss Melanny Bell here, who is a um, um, community engagement uh, uh, facilitator. And Miss Bell, would you like to say a few words? Sure, okay. okay, I just wanted to make sure my mic is on. Good evening, everybody. Um, like Matt said, my name is Melanie Bell, and I'll be working in the capacity as a community engagement specialist. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I've been in education for about 17 years. I actually started out as an ELA um, teacher um, in the city. 
Um, I've done some instructional coaching, and currently I do a lot of work around restorative practices and restorative justice. Um, for anybody who's unfamiliar with that, um, what it means is just I do work um, that involves uh, resolving conflict and also building community within schools. So I support schools, teachers, and students in implementing restorative practices on a whole school level. Um, so my work here is just to support the pr process and support you all um, through coming to consensus and through some of the um, group activities that we'll be doing together. Okay? Is there another Yes. Yep. Um. Okay. And so um, one of the things that we um, like to establish is just norms and expectations for working together. So I'm just going to briefly review these. Um, this will be something that will come up each time we work together, but it's something we want you to keep in mind as, as, as we move through this process. Um, so first, just being inclusive by allowing each person the opportunity to have their voices lifted. So I know, I don't know about you, but sometimes people talk a little bit too slow for me, and I want to kind of brush over what they're saying. So we're just saying, just allow space for every group member to have, to voice whatever it is that they're thinking, and also to allow process time so that you can respond um, based on what you, what you heard, okay? Um, another uh, norm and expectation is just cons um, spend enough time considering each proposed change and think about how it will impact the community and also diverse stakeholders within the community, All right? Um, also, as you move through the process, you want to be mindful and always keep in your um, forefront the boundary study guidelines and use each as a guide in the collaborative process. So you're using the boundary study guidelines as a lens to guide your decisions. And then lastly, um, if conflict or contention arises, just be mindful of how you're speaking, what your body language is communicating, and as much as possible, just use I statements. Um, rather than, you know, you did so and so and such and such. Um, I'm going to add one more um, norm and guideline, and that is you can expect that um, there might be non-closure, right? Because this is a process, questions that you have might not be answered in this session, but the following session we always build and we attempt as much as possible to answer any questions that come up. And then also, same thing as you're thinking through things, just, just know that you might not um, have closure immediately, okay? So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Um, so to give you a little bit of background about the Northeast area, um, the BCPS is in the midst of a, a, of a $1.3 billion Schools for Our Future Capital Plan to add capacity to support uh, increasing enrollment and also to improve facilities in the area. And I've, I drove around the, the, uh, the district today, the study area today, and I saw a lot of uh, construction signs the front in, in the front of schools and things like that. So it's evident that that uh, this work is being done in this area. Um, this includes accelerating the process of air conditioning in all schools. Um, the northeast area of Baltimore County Schools has been targeted as a region for facility improvement, and a boundary change process has been initiated um, in this area for nine schools in this area. So, uh, which is what brings us here. Um, the participating schools are listed on, on, on this PowerPoint slide, and I think everybody, uh, from what I've heard, there are people who are, uh, live in the areas or are affiliated with all of these schools. One thing I wanted to remind you as a committee or, or sort of give you a briefing as a, com as a committee member, as I said, the focus is on a plan that best meets the needs of all kids in this area. But as you as a committee member, the biggest value that you bring to this process is that you all live in this area, you shop in this area. You you, uh, you 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 go to go to school and you walk around, go to parks and things like that. So the real value that you bring is as we start looking at options and things like that, you can give us perspectives that we may not know, such as where there's heavy traffic congestion at in the in the evenings and what areas get bottlenecked, where you see kids walking to school and where 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 you where um you know where where buses are traveling and things like that. Things that you observe on a daily basis as you live around. And, and, um, and just and live your life in this community. That's really the, the, the fruit of, 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 your, of your labor is gonna be very important in giving us that, in, that input as we start to evaluate options. 
The following factors are driving the need to look at attendance boundaries in this area. And this includes a construction of a new elementary school in the northeast area located at the intersection of Joppa Road and Chapel Road. Uh, you drive out there right now, it's hard to see. You can see the sign, but there's really just trees and a driveway that rides back there. But eventually, soon enough, there's going to be a school there, and, and your task is to help draw a boundary for that. Um, it's opening in 2018-19 school year and expected to accommodate about 725 students. All nine schools in this area are overcrowded, um, and you can see it in every building, and I, I think that everybody who, as you know, when you go through the buildings, you can, you can agree with this. Um, and five of the schools exceed 115% utilization, and Perry Hall is severely overcrowded at 130% of its capacity. So there certainly is an evident need to, to, to bring some relief to the schools in this area. Uh, beyond the study area for the new northwest, uh, northeast area, reconstruction expansion of Victory Villa is underway to relieve overcrowding in the region. And the school is also set to open in the 2018-19 school year. And I do see some familiar faces on the committee and people who were involved in the Victory Villa process, which occurred earlier this year. And so Vincent Farms was in involved in that and they're at the table here as well. And so, um, so that, that, that's one of, the, one of the nuances of this process is that, is that it's a two-part process. Both schools will be opening in the 2018-19 school year. Um, as I said, the revised boundaries for the schools in the Victory Villa area were approved by the board in June 2017. Um, so for, as it relates to Vincent Farms, some changes were made to the southern to the southern part of the Vincent Farms, Farms boundary, but there were not um, adjustments made in the northern part, the areas adjacent to, to where we're looking at, um, adjacent to Chapel Hill and up in this area. Um, so Vincent Farms, the only school that's included in both, both boundary change studies. And um, as I said, the, the, we, we're, we are planning with the, the changes that were made in or earlier this year for the southern part of the Vincent Farm boundary. Um, but they still, um, they still, as you can see, they could probably still use some, some relief, um, but that's up to you. So there are boundary study objectives. Uh, the, um, the, the key objectives that, that we have to focus on are to reduce overcrowding in the region, to create viable and successful boundaries, to utilize the added capacity of, this, of the new school that's being uh, planned, and other schools involved in the study and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. So we'll be giving you lots of data and statistics as we get into options to help support all of these objectives. As I mentioned, there is a, uh, the considerations, are, which are Rule 1280. These are the board approved uh, policy, and these are the rules to follow when you start evaluating boundaries. So um, these include maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods, Maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. The impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, so looking at the impact on, uh, on walkability and things like that and transportation. Uh, minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned, so try not to move students uh, if they have been re reassigned recently. Efficient use of capacity in affected schools long-term enrollment and capacity trends in future capital plans, location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns, and phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, which um, that doesn't uh, pertain to us because our focus in this study is, is elementary schools. We are, not, we are not looking at making any changes to any middle school boundaries or high school boundaries in this process. This process is only involving boundary change and boundary line adjustments for elementary schools only. And um, when you look at these rules, there's a, there's a list of rules, and, and as you start, to, start to, to draw options together and look at options, you'll realize that no plan is going to be perfect. There's always going to be some challenge uh, with the plan or always going to be some level of heartburn that you have with any particular plan. But the best plan is going to be one that, that adheres to these rules as a whole as best as possible, okay? So uh, just keep that in mind, and that it's, it's going to be, it's nearly impossible to make a perfect plan uh, and, uh, as, as, as I have uh, experienced across, across the country. Additional considerations for you to uh, think about is using ge geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways. You have a lot of major roads that uh, uh, come through the study area uh, that to, to look at and things that uh, you want to avoid uh, 
if, if at all possible, certainly don't want kids crossing over certain roads or walking across certain busy roads and things like that. And then elimination of existing satellite boundaries. And satellite boundaries are areas that are, district, that are districted to a school that are not contiguous. So, um, it's, so for instance, you'll have a main boundary for a school, but then you'll have another small boundary that's not connected that also feeds students into that school. In this area, there is a satellite area, and it's, and it's Oakley Elementary, and it has, a, it has a small enclave or a satellite area up um, uh, near Kearney that feeds down into Oakley. And you'll see that when you look at the, the maps. So it's typically a, a best practice to try to, um, to not have those, those enclaves or satellites because it, um, it helps bring you closer to the overall considerations, uh, proximity to the school, transportation efficiency, those types of things are some things that, that really, uh, that we try not to create enclaves or satellites, but we'll let you uh, have an open evaluation and explore um, the causes and effects or impacts of, of, of removing the Oakley satellite area. So in your packets, you have a background report. I think it's in the first couple of pages, you'll see the background report. Um, and the purpose of this background report is to expand the knowledge of each committee member. Um, another key thing is that there's data and information in here so that you can share a consistent and accurate message. The most important thing when you get into this process, when you leave here and you talk to your neighbors or people at church or whatever it may be, they're talking to you and asking questions about it. The most important thing is don't speculate. Don't say, well, I think it's going to be this, or I think this is what's going to happen. You really need to uh, stay focused on the actual data and let this be a data-driven process. And, and um, there's no telling how the final result, the final recommendation is going to turn out. And, and you'll see as we start working through this, there's going to be lots of variations of maps and things like that. But the background report is a good reference guide. If someone asks, what's the capacity of a school? You can go right to the background report and look at it. You can look at a lot of statistics and information. And you'll notice that there's only about a, an eighth of, a, eighth of an inch uh, paper in this background report, but you have a three inch binder. As this process continues, you'll get more materials. And by the end of the process, the binder will be full with well, a lot of data and information as you request it, as we create other, other, other information. Key, key piece, uh, parts of the background report to familiarize yourself with uh, at this point are the considerations, which are on page two, and those are the Rule 1280, uh, policy in Rule 1280, uh, the timeline on page four. Um, there's some school enrollment facility tables in Appendix A, so that's just for starters to give you an idea on the facilities and, uh, and some information about the facilities. And then there are some maps in Appendix B, and uh, those are some maps that I'm going to talk about here. So, and when you interpret the maps, uh, one of the th always look at the title of the map. The title will tell you what the map is showing. You've got a legend, and the legend will help you understand what the colors represent on the map. So you can see the attendance boundaries are represented as colors. Schools, elementaries are squares. Middle schools are triangles. High schools are stars. Um, and when you start looking at these maps in, uh, in, a, in Appendix B, you'll notice there are some uh, uh, black and white dashed outlines around uh, different communities and it's in uh, what we call these are call these are planning blocks and these are actually building blocks for redistricting so as you start to work through process you're gonna you're, you'll look at at moving planning blocks one place one way or the other we provide a lot of information on these planning blocks such as the number of students that live uh, in that planning block that go to the go to a boundary school so that you could say if uh, what if I move this area from this school to that school you can look at the planning block you say okay there's 50 students in that planning in that area and the capacity had they have capacity over here so I can move this planning block over this way so it really helps empower you with the ability to to see and understand what the impacts would be of moving an area one way or the other and uh, one of our exercises tonight will be to have you evaluate these and give us your first impression of them and see if there's any adjustments that we should make to planning blocks. These are blocks that we have drafted uh, for starters based on our ex experience and looking at road networks and, and, uh, and feeder patterns and things like that. And so um, and trying not to split up communities and trying try not to split uh, down the middle of a subdivision and things like that. Um, but, but again, your local knowledge can certainly benefit and, and tell us uh, what you think. 
Page 23 of the background report has some information that shows where students live and attend school. So these, this is what we call a, a matrix or a cross tab, and this basically helps you understand how many kids live in a zone or a boundary, and then how many, where those students that live in the boundary go to school. So when you look at this, you can see Kearney has 558 students. The top row shows you living in. So 558 students living in the Kearney boundary, and then if you scroll down, if you look down, you can say of the 558, 515 go to Kearney Elementary, two students go to Chapel Hill, one goes to Gunpowder. So you can look at it that way and see how many, where are the total students that live in there, where are they going to school. The green, the green cells are shows the students that live and attend in their zoned school. So you can see that. And then if you wanted to look the other way, you could say 559 students attend Kearney, and 515 live in Kearney, one lives in Gunpowder, four live in Oakley, and so on and so forth. So you can look at it two different ways. That helps you get an idea of where students are co coming and going in a, in, uh, in a, at any particular school. And that's something that uh, I can certainly help you interpret if you have questions as you look at it and, uh, and study it. We have other support uh, services here for you and uh, uh, staff are here to help support you. The BCPS leadership and staff are here to provide data and information. Um, they up update the superintendent as needed and they ensure that the policy and processes are followed. So if you've got a question that's out of my, out of my wheelhouse and something more policy related and things like that, then uh, you'll, you may hear from a staff member come up and, and talk about it. Um, they support avenues for community engagement and they are objective participants in this process as well. <clears throat> a couple of ground rules in terms of communication for the process. It's designed so that business of the committee is conducted during committee meetings. Um, if you have questions in between meetings, you can contact the district at boundarystudy at bcps.org or by phone at 443-809-4216. And that's, that's something if you have uh, questions in between, we will, we will address your questions and, um, and certainly um, try, to, try to answer anything that you have and get you what you need. Um, communications re received related to committee discussions and deliberations will be shared with all members. So if you send an email to this boundary study email, we will uh, share all of that information with the committee so that the full committee can benefit from any discussion that's, or question that's being posed on this, uh, at this email address. Um, so email is the main mode of communication in between uh, co uh, committee meetings. And so we, we like to, um, you already are doing a, a, a big task here. So we, we don't want to uh, belabor you with, with having to, to meet with individual groups and things like that. It's important to have it be the work of the committee, stay with the committee, and anything in between, just communicate via email. Uh, we will not share your email addresses or contact information publicly. So we want to protect you as, as, a, as people and make sure that your, your personal information is not shared and, uh, and that you don't get somebody coming up and knocking on your door and things like that. Um, so in order to keep things, keep you, uh, your, pers your pr privacy, we ask not to share contact information with others, but keep things w through that boundary study email so that the whole committee can benefit from any communication or questions that are asked. And all communication regarding the process are considered public information. So anytime that you email us or contact us, um, it is, it it is uh, public information. So just be mindful of that. And, uh, anything that you send to us can, can be sh uh, seen and viewed by anybody um, in the public. We do have a web page um, for this process, and um, it's uh, bcps.org in slash construction slash northeast. If you go to the main web page, you'll see on the left there's a blue section that says uh, uh, what's happening, and then you'll, you'll see the northeast area down there. That's gonna have a repository for all the material. All the materials that are presented to you tonight will be posted up there so that any member of the public can go print off the materials and they can follow the process um, just and print off and have a, have a binder just like you if, if, they, if they want to do so. Um, and so re remember to refer to your background report if there are, is any questions or anything like that. Um, so, before we get into that, I want to know, are there any questions about things that I had covered so far? Um, and, then, and if not, we're going to get into a, a little exercise with you. 
Okay, with that said, Ms. Bell. Okay, so great. So what we're gonna um, do now is um, give you all an opportunity to begin talking with one another and also brainstorming. So we're gonna participate in opportunity analysis. Um, basically, what we're gonna have you all do is look at the current boundary as it is and assess what the strengths of that current boundary um, or boundaries are, as well as the limitations. And then we're gonna ha have you consider um, given that we are engaged in this process, what opportunities um, does it present um, for the new boundary? And also what challenges does it present as well? Okay? okay. Thanks. Um, so what we're gonna have you do, um, is, any, are, is everybody sitting at their color-coded tables? Does anybody need to move? Okay, so, all right, so in, in, a, in, um, in a moment. So we want you to be grouped according to, um, to colors. And again, you're going, to look at, you're going to look at the current boundary and assess the strengths and limitations. And then you're gonna look at the opportunities that are being presented by this process, as well as the challenges to, to changing or shifting the boundary. Um, we're asking that you record your thoughts on uh, chart paper, and specifically, we're asking that you also record your questions, because some of the questions that um, may arise, we may be able to answer today, and or it might be something that we can take back and find further information on to bring to the next session. So it's really important that you capture both the information as well as any questions um, that, that arise. Can we do one more? I think one more slide. Yeah. The other thing that we're asking is that um, uh, you all take a role. So we're asking that one or two people act as like a discussion guide. So in this role, you're making sure that this discussion stays on track. You might be monitoring time and also just being checked in to make sure that everybody's being uh, um, allowed equal voice, okay? Um, we're asking that one or two people um, are the reporter because after you're finished with the opportunity analysis, we'll share out together. So um, just identifying who feels comfortable doing that. Um, we're asking that one person is described, so just recording what the group um, comes up with. And then the parking lot attendant, and here's the piece, that person is the one who's gonna write down any questions that come up and we'll um, debrief those as well, okay? Any questions about, about what you're about to engage in? Okay, great. So if you're not with your color-coded team, if you could, <laughs> if you could go um, you know, to your respective place, that would be great. Um, the last thing I wanna say is you, you can also take a few minutes um, if it's useful to kind of look at the data. So look at the maps, also look at the data um, that Matt talked about, and then you can begin your discussions. And we'll come back together in about 15 minutes.
one thing I forgot to mention is you have, a, you have a series of maps in front of you. You can always reference those maps for this exercise, but we are going to get into a bigger, a, a more detailed exercise and review of, of the planning block map. But you're welcome to use those as you do this, this particular exercise.
just a little time reminder, we have about five more minutes. So if you haven't recorded um, your strengths, et cetera, on the chart, please do so. And if you have any questions, please record those as well.
Okay. So we want to come back together so we can um, share out. Um, if you want to take a few seconds just to determine who's going to be the speaker, if you haven't done so already, that would be great. Okay. All right. And is there any group that is like living to go first? Anybody want to share out for her first? Yes. All right. I'm going to give you my mic if, if you don't mind so everybody can hear. So our um, supportive, our strengths were that there are a lot of logical boundaries that we see, and there's a lot of community involvement. So that's definitely two really good strengths. Limitations is transportation. We were looking at that Kingsville area, and if you look down, you know, just the time students would be on buses and things, making those transitions uh, is definitely a limitation. As well as there's with so many schools in the area overcrowded, over capacity, there is a limited amount of seats available to do certain juggling in certain areas. Opportunities, um, we definitely see an opportunity to absorb that satellite area um, into uh, whatever boundaries we create. And challenges are perceptions that uh, the community might have about different schools in different areas. Um, and then um, just, thinking about new building and, and how that will saturate certain areas. So while we're thinking about the boundaries, also thinking about all the new building that is continuing as we're speaking. Okay, all right, this group, great. <laughs> uh, so, Group Orange, um, we did our uh, supportive and restrictive um, present future. So our strengths were uh, transportation. Uh, one of the things that um, we looked at was um, the opportunity for um, transportation not only to, to grow but to, um, to be able to um, ex expedite some of the, um, the challenges in um, having the children in certain areas. So transportation was one of those things. Uh, limitation, uh, limitation as well. Um, what we felt with uh, transportation, it may um, hinder some people. For example, uh, when we were looking at, at certain districts uh, for certain families who won't be able to um, drive their kids to school, for example, or um, walking, uh, being in, in walking distance, for example, because they don't have sidewalks or certain things. So transportation uh, also limits us in certain ways. Um, highways and streets, uh, we looked at, um, when we looked at a lot of the boundaries, um, the highways and, and streets, as you all know, don't have sidewalks. So that limits our kids from possibly walking to school or being safe as they're going there. So that was why our buses come in. Uh, location of the satellite school, um, that came up because one of the schools um, was in an orange district, but it actually passes to elementary schools before they get to that school. Um, the opportunities. Uh, we looked at the opportunities um, on the positive as well as the challenge. So transportation again came up. Um, there's opportunity for growth in, in a lot of areas where um, as the parents communicate with people, um, transportation uh, can actually um, increase communication. Um, diversity. Um, we felt with um, Schools, uh, with school redistricting, it can actually um, create a very diverse and very um, enlightening for a lot of people from being from different areas, different backgrounds. So it um, provides that. Um, making it more pedestrian friendly. Again, sidewalks, sidewalks, sidewalks. Um, decreasing uh, overcrowding. Um, as we look at it, um, the opportunity for that to decrease overcrowding is, um, is extremely uh, central, especially for our teachers and our um, uh, administrators and cohesiveness in the communities um, a lot of times where we said um, for a lot of people who live in apartments or townhomes they can move right across the street and not know that um, they're actually being redistricted so um, that within those communities can uh, have some cohesiveness so you know for example if you have to if you're expanding your family and go from a one-bedroom to a two-bedroom you know that you're still going to the same school uh, where the teachers and you love and care for 
Um, a lot of the challenges, again, transportation came up, but um, distance between schools. One of the challenges are, again, um, one of the parents said that um, living in Kingsville, sometimes it was an hour and a half or more uh, ride. So trying to shorten the distance between some of those schools um, is very imperative for, uh, for parents, and, and that uh, eases a lot of the, um, the stress as well. Another group? You ready? Okay. Okay, so we said that some of our present strengths would be um, we this community, this area has strong schools um, and a strong community with a lot of um, local and major businesses and that um, you know the Perry Hall community and surrounding is a very um, unified community. Um, but some of the present uh, limitations, or we have, you know, the overcrowded schools, as we all know, um, and that the, the areas, there's the very condensed areas, um, and then you also have the more open land, like in Kingsville. Um, and the transportation issues, like he was saying with Kingsville, how it takes, you know, so long to, you know, get back and forth from home and school. Um, also, what was brought up, I think when we were talking about if, there was ever in the future going to be any new schools in the Kingsville area. Um, there would be a limitation with like public water versus well water. Um, and then future opportunities, um, students could attend schools that were closer to them. Um, and, uh, you know, the schools would be less crowded. Um, but then the challenges with that, um, especially with the less crowded schools, would be for how long will they be less crowded for? What new... Um, businesses are being built or new um, homes, uh, new construction that's being built um, where those students would impact the less crowded schools would then become crowded again. Um, and I think that's it. Is that everything? I think so. And traffic patterns. Um, of course, I'm sure everybody agrees with the traffic patterns. Um, I think that's it. Yep. Okay. Ready? Okay. Well, nobody can read my handwriting anyway, so I guess I'll. <laughs> There's all these teachers here, so they had the guy with the worst handwriting take the notes. So I'm going to read it because nobody else can probably read what I'm writing. Um, uh, the strengths we had were there were major roads for boundaries, um, like Route 1 and Route 43, stuff like that, for the most part. Um, and that there was only one satellite. I know in other districts they may have multiple satellites. We only have one satellite. We have to try to work our way around here. Uh, limitations were uh, large blocks. Uh, some of these school districts have blocks of, up of 150 to 170 kids, so it's hard to move those Tetris pieces as you're trying to figure out the, the puzzle. And then uh, congestion, like someone just said, it can take a while to get from one place to another, whether it's a bus or coming um, for school, school kids. Uh, opportunities, one opportunity we saw was trying to figure out a way to not cross Route 1. So there are some school districts that are broken up right down the middle by Route 1. Maybe trying to find a way to alleviate that if possible. Uh, and also to balance enrollment across these schools uh, to um, even the numbers out a little bit. Uh, I think challenge, a huge challenge is that there's actually more than 725 uh, uh, over capacity. So even with this school, some, some schools aren't going to see the relief maybe they thought they would see when they heard about this school happening. And then uh, feeder patterns, considering that for uh, middle and high school feeder, padding, feeder patterns as they might change if they build a new school or something like that were to happen. And then also a big one is uh, future housing and growth. Um, you know, they're building 2,000 homes down along 43, so that's gonna affect schools for sure over the next couple years. So that was a big challenge for us. I'm going to go here. Okay. <laughs> so we may have looked at it just a little bit differently and talked more about the schools as a, as a whole and how the um, community needs to rally around the new school and moving the children and how that would make people feel um, with the sense of community. Right now, at, as it was said before, how the community is so united. So a new school... Um, it will really have to build that sense of community, but it has great potential for our kids, and the buses are definitely an, op an obstacle. We want to keep the short short bus rides. Um, 
and I think it will help also with the dismissal of the kids, getting them in and out of the schools faster and keep them off of the buses as uh, much as they are now. Um, we also thought that it would give our children better opportunities in the school once the, the lines are changed and the kids are um, kind of evened out a little bit better than they are now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, as we looked at the maps, we looked at strengths. We noticed that generally the boundaries kept na uh, keep neighborhoods intact. They are mostly separated by major highways, and there's a strong sense of community relations in the school system or in the schools currently. Limitations were overcrowding and limited diversity in some schools. Also opportunities, we thought about alleviating um, the overcrowding, possibility of eliminating satellite communities, and building new communities, and more diversity as an opportunity. Some challenges we noticed was the building of the new communities, along with the continued growth that comes with the building of those communities. All right, thank you, everyone. I'm gonna pass it over to Matt. Um, yep. Um, thank you, Ms. Bell, and, and thank you all for this. Uh, I'm gonna take this information, and I'm gonna put it into a summary document we will for you for the next meeting. Um, and this is certainly helpful for me to understand some of the things from your perspectives uh, as a community. I could do this myself as a, as a consultant looking from outside from Ohio, but uh, getting this input and some of this local feedback is, is certainly helpful. Um, I know that we had asked you to document if you had any questions as you start to, start to dive into some of the materials. And there was one question that I'd like to address uh, that, uh, that was asked and somebody had, had noticed that this is, uh, this is the September 30th, 2016 data. And um, as we, we do this all the time, processes usually start in around September or August, like we are here, and they'll span across into the new school year. And so we're, we're in a part where we're kind of straddling 2016-17 data and 2017-18 data. In our experience, we don't typically see seismic adjustments or shifts that occur in, in one year's time. So, um, so we will be looking at 2016-17, but with that said, we, as the new data starts to come out and 17-18 data starts to come out, you're gonna be somewhat midway through this process. And um, as that data starts to come out, we will be looking at that and, ex and examining the, the, the new data to see if there is any type of potential impact. And if it's something that is, that is substantial or significant enough, um, we will be providing you some new information using the 17-18 information so we want to make sure you have as good a data and information as possible and uh, just wanted to let you know that we are mindful of that and aware of that um, if you have other questions that you had noted um, please make sure that you document them and we will follow up with you at the next meeting to make sure that we address any questions or concerns that you may have uh, make sure that you document those uh, on the flip chart or someplace so that we can we can obtain that and get that information from you and follow up with you on that. Um, we have one more exercise and we're, we're, we're following pretty well on time. So um, this is a planning block exercise. And you've all started to see, started to look at the, the maps and the data. In front of you, you have the same maps that we have posted up in front of me here on both sides. Um, we have a, a map that shows the um, number of the planned unit developments so this kind of gives you an idea of where the growth is and where the planned residential construction is is in the study area the lighter it goes a color scale from light yellow to dark uh, dark brown and the lighter colored areas reflect l less number of units and the dark brown areas are areas that are expected to have a, a larger number of planned units um, and so that's that's a piece of information that we have in front of you as one of your maps there's also a map that has walk zones here, so the walk areas. So you can see the, the, we have just the walk areas are color coded on this map so that you could see where, um, where the areas are designated for students that do not, are not provided transportation, but they do walk to school. Um, 
There's other two other maps in your pack that's one with aerial imagery so that you can get an idea of what it really looks like in reality in terms of an aerial image. And then there's a map that shows the zoning and so that you can understand where the residential areas are, where the commercial and industrial areas are, because you'll see big large areas on the map. They may not all be residential, they may be a large industrial area and other things to be mindful of. And finally, there's a map on here that shows the planning blocks and the current boundaries. And this is what we'd like you to do with this next exercise, is to study this map and look at it. Um, I saw there was a mention of the, uh, one that has a large number of students in it, things like that. I'd like you to look at those planning blocks. If you see really big numbers, question, think, think is there a way that, that that planning block could maybe further be split? Or if not, if it's an entire community and it's splitting a neighborhood or a subdivision, then it may meet, need to stay large. Likewise, if you see a planning block that's splitting a subdivision that you feel needs to be merged together, you can take note of that. You have markers in front of you and you have uh, little post-it notes. So we encourage you, I know that these are really nice maps, um, but please be, uh, be fully liberal in marking up on the map. You can, you can use the Sharpies and you can write on the maps, take notes on the maps, because I take these back with me and I study them and I make further adjustments based on your feedback. One final thought or note is in your background report, each school has a zoom in of the school boundary and that, and that shows de more detail of planning blocks. So if you're having a tough time seeing these because they're, you know, some of the labels are small, you can reference that other, that other note. So we'll give you some time to look at the planning blocks and you can mark up the maps and give us any notes or any thoughts about the planning blocks. You're not looking at trying to make changes to boundaries right now, more of just the building blocks and how those building blocks may need to be altered, okay? So um, we'll let you go and I'll browse around and, make, and, and see if you have any questions.
Do you think uh, five more minutes is good for you guys to, to uh, do your preliminary markup? If you need more time, that's fine. Let's, let's look at a soft target of five minutes.
Hey, um, all right, guys. Well, to uh, keep on time, I think it's, uh, it's probably a good time for us to uh, regroup as a whole committee. And let's, let's have just a discussion um, as a group. And we'll let each subgroup kind of share some of their thoughts, kind of a sum summary of uh, if you had some key discussions, things and conversations you had, I would love to hear it as well as the rest of the committee. Um, so if we want to start, uh, do we want to start with you guys first, or, um, and then we'll work our way around? And just go ahead and share us your thoughts. Or, um, and if you have a map, any markups, if you could uh, have a couple committee members hold up the map so the rest of the group can see your map, that would be very helpful too. We started on the, um, with the satellite school and then working from the, it's hard to talk without the map. <laughs> with Seven Oaks and Kearney and Perry Hall Middle and into Gunpowder, kind of using Bel Air Road as our dividing line. Um, thinking that adjusting that side would then alleviate and be able to help to uh, move the other schools into change the lines on that end. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure, so you guys were talking about potential scenarios, potential ways that boundaries could be shifted to, to think about. And uh, you know, I heard a lot of conversations about that. I think um, Bel Air Road kind of makes itself its own dividing line. We don't really want our kids walking across it, and we don't want our buses having to turn on and off of it. It kind of makes sense to kind of use that as our divider. And that's as far as we got. Okay, thank you. Did you guys have any other, were there any other discussions or general discussions about uh, anything that you want to share, any other thoughts or anything like that? Well, Take the mic for a second. Yes, sir. We were also looking at our top heavy schools and kind of making them a priority because, I mean, we're here because of the numbers. So let's look at the schools that are just, we know are grossly overpopulated and kind of prioritize that to try to e equal things out a little bit. Okay. Because, I mean, we can solve a problem today, but if it's going to be a problem five years from now, then we need to kind of be a little bit proactive in our planning. Yes, and uh, you know one of the focuses is try to minimize the impact. So it's certainly you know keeping that and the essence of that is certainly carries through. Um, okay, we want to. Oh, did you, we can go over here. You guys want to go next? <laughs> you volunteered. <laughs> okay, well I'll say my part, and then Chris will tell you what they talked about. Um, because I'll just go with the concerns first, and that way he'll tell you the map part. And can my you, biggest concern... Could you guys hold up a map yeah. if you're going to point to it? Uh, help us out so that we can all see what you're looking at. Okay. So I know that the satellite area is, is a huge concern for a lot of people. Obviously, me, I am a <laughs> parent of Oakley Elementary. Um, but, you know, this parent, teacher, and I, while they were kind of working on boundaries and talking similar over here with numbers and, and lines and things, we thought about the connection that these parents have with these schools. And that's another important part. I mean, you know, I'm the PTA president right now. I'm gonna be working very diligently to make sure that my parents are very connected and they feel like this is a great place for them to be and they wanna stay. And then we start absorbing and switching out lines for them, you know, if they're kindergarten or first grade, whatever and you know pushing them to other schools and they might not feel as comfortable um, or they don't have the connection with the administration or staff or whatever the case so that that was just my concern as we were talking and i know someone came over and helped talk to us say more information will come about that demographic but that was just in my mind because i'm not the best map person in the world sure. but i'll give it to chris Fine. yes thank you um our area of focus was the one that we have outlined in purple um, we literally came up with, uh, with the time, uh, two alternative futures, and that was the, um, the PB80 area, which would be the orange area, um, and our first alternative future was for that to be um, absorbed or to connect with uh, Perry Hall Elementary School. Um, we, once we did that, we realized that that would add 94 to Perry Hall um, uh, middle um, Elementary School, 
However, um, we weren't able to um, work out where we would have to um, detract from or to move people from that other area. So we moved to another um, alternative future, which was the second one, which was, it's a little more complicated. Um, but what we did was, um, PB 84, 83, 80, 60, and 62. So that would be, um, which area is that? Um, this, uh, yes, this area here, we moved to Seven Oaks. Thank you. We moved to, uh, to, to Seven Oaks Elementary. And then the other area, um, I'm sorry, so 76, 16, 50, and 78, which are these areas, was moved to Seven Oaks. And then the, um, the 84, 83, 80, 60, 62, and 63 were moved to Kearney. So that would literally create a natural boundary here where they would go to Kearney and then they would go to Seven Oaks. That way that would reduce um, both areas and would have minimal impact, maybe an increase in some areas. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, this, is, this is good. You guys are doing a lot of uh, forward thinking. At the next meeting, we're really going to get into options and we're going to give the opportunity to, to sketch out options that you think are viable and things like that. But we'll take this information and these notes and, uh, and, 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 and so, that, so that, you can, that you can certainly leverage them at the next meeting when we really start looking at the alternatives and options and things like that. So that's very helpful. Um, Okay, um, did you guys have any other thoughts or comments and conversations and things like that you'd like to share? Or is, so that was good, okay. Um, what about this group? Since we're right here, would you guys wanna share what your thoughts are? Or, uh, any markups on the maps or anything like that? Um, <laughs> so basically we talked about the other side where Vincent Farms is and Chapel Hill and the new school area. We saw, if you guys didn't notice, Vincent Farm down here at the bottom, they have like 391 students in this area down here, which is crazy. So we thought about relieving Vincent Farm and trying to push this area up here like PB10 and PB11 over to Chapel Hill, and then the area like P20, PB29, PB155, 157, 159 go to the new school, and then possibly this area up here, PB133, 134, maybe, depending on transportation, go to Kingsville. That's kind of um, as far as we got, really. Um, we started more with like the Vincent Farm area. Yeah, and there's gonna be a new development in Vincent Farms too, that's gonna have a lot of kids in it. PB11 and PB9 are close, like they're tight knit neighborhoods, that's why we thought they should stay together. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, who wants to go next? Would you guys like to go next? So I, I think we kind of did it a little differently. We, we were a little confused sort of, but we started looking at um, individual maps in our binder. Um, and we kind of just looked at each, um, each school uh, map and uh, tried to figure out where the, you know, the most crowded was. We really didn't come up with any kind of real solutions yet of, or moving um, blocks, but I mean, we, it just raised more questions of, um, our major question was um, what the enrollment would be at Vincent Farm once the Victory Villa School opens. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to know that, what that number was before we started fooling around with the other schools. Um, so that's kind of about where we got. Sure, and, and we weren't asking you to come up with an alternative scenario. I think people had been talking about it and they're, they're anxious, you know, committee members, and this always happens, they're anxious to look, dive into it, and you know, so that's certainly encouraging as we get into that process, but you know, we were looking to um, more to as an evaluation of the planning blocks at this point, but um, not to say you can't look at all the other, other pieces of the, of the maps and such. 
Um, do you have another? Yes, sure. Is your, is your planning block with Victory Villa incorporated? Yes, ma'am. So this is the, so I totaled it and it got 699 as the enrollment, but when I look down, I see it's like 780 something at Vincent Farm. So you see the 780 number, you're like, whoa, we can't put anybody there. That's right, okay. So the, the planning blocks, the, the data in the planning blocks do in the shape of the planning block for Vincent Farms reflects the, the most recent one with the changes in Victory Villa. The enrollment data that you see in the tables is still reflective of this 2016-17 enrollment, which doesn't, ind doesn't reflect the, the areas that were moved out of Vincent Farms. I just think that's something to note for everyone because yes. it's two totally different numbers. That's right. Everyone's so scared to put anything at Vincent Farm when actually they're going to be getting some relief from Victory Villa. That's correct. They will be. And when we, get, when we provide data at the, at the next meeting, you'll have, uh, you'll, it'll be reflective of, those, of that reduction that's already occurred. And one more thing we thought might be helpful is if we could get a closer map, like you've done a closer map of each school, but of the Northeast School with the grid blocks all around that. Okay. Still shaded, so you can say okay. this many from Perry Hall, this many from, it could help with a, more of a zoomed in of the, where the new school's gonna be with the grid blocks around. Sure thing, no problem. Thank you. Um, there was a question over here asking about when will we get the, the new school year data for 1718. That doesn't, it doesn't come out uh, until September 30th is when the official enrollment is tabulated. We, don't have it here, we, 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 uh, we will be looking at it. It's, it's sometimes we'll incorporate it into the process midway through and sometimes we don't. Um, and so. Okay. Hang on. Sure. Overcrowding other areas. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, to, she was she was saying that she does feel that seventeen eighteen data is important to have incorporated into this process. And you know, and I don't disagree with you. I think having the most recent information is certainly useful. And so that's something that something that we will that I will look at and talk with the district about providing when it's available. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, you guys want to go next? I know you raised your hand. So the task, as we understood it, wasn't to start kind of redistricting. That's but right, yes. to look at um, the different blocks and if there's anything that, that didn't look cohesive or neighborhoods were broken up. Um, and it's so hard because we're just, you know, covering a small area so we can look at our neighborhood. So I think it's important if everyone who lives in a certain neighborhood looks and says, well, I know for a fact that the kids right across this street, and it's not a major street, go to a different school, and that doesn't sit right with the community to kind of voice that opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that we were thinking is look at the blocks closest to the boundary lines right now, because those are the ones that are going to be affected. Um, we drew a red circle right around where the new school is going to be. So obviously, keeping with staying close to your school as possible, mm -hmm. those are the blocks that we really need to focus on and those numbers and numbers that are four in a, you know, an area, do they get merged with another area that's a lesser to kind of merge those blocks or do we leave them? And then the outer circle, leaving Kingsville alone because <laughs> it's such a big um, span, but the outer circle is kind of the domino effect that those borders might be changed mm -hmm. and should we should look closely at those blocks and is there anything we didn't know what to do with them but that's kind of the approach that we were taking okay and going uh, going back to vincent farm um that we just generally need to think about the new development that's growing there and some of the questions we had was um you know what do you have any statistics or anything that that correlate so there's in the bottom of vincent farm there's a really big um, growth that's going to happen there between 500 and like a thousand homes. Do you have any evidence or data that shows that correlates to such and such amount of students or that kind of thing? Um, because we don't want to, we basically said all the, the schools are going to be over capacity still. It's mm. just, you know, how much more do we want to try and keep everybody? Um, but that was one of our questions. And then another one was some of the issues that came up were portable classrooms. Some people call them villas, <laughs> which is, sounds nice, but mm -hmm. um, trailers or 
cottages. It all sounds lovely. Cottages. Yeah. All sounds lovely. How many? How many of them are already at schools? Because as we start this process and 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 moving people around, can the schools actually handle it? And if they can or they can, how many more? portable classrooms would that mean for those schools? Yes, and one thing to note is that the capacity numbers that we'll be working with through this process, and we're really gonna start focusing on capacity at the next meeting, those do not include the capacity of the portable, the portable capacity. It doesn't. It does not, so it is only the bricks and mortar capacity, not including the portables. And so that's, that's and, I, and we'll talk about state rated capacity at the next meeting, kind of give you a little orientation on how that's calculated. Um, and I will follow up in terms of number of portables that are currently at the buildings. Um, if it's not in some of the state stats that you have now, I think it's something that we can certainly look at providing for you. Okay, uh, did you guys go? Okay. So we took into consideration those natural boundaries and we just looked at um, ways that we could shift the blocks to um, distribute the amount of students in each area a little bit better and to absorb that satellite school into um, into Kearney yep yeah so uh, that's and we did the we looked at where the new school was going to be and we just wanted to see like a basic um, we did like a circle just so we could see like what was around that school how many students it would draw if, that, if it was just that easy of course it's not but um, but we just try to like shift as many things the the problem is you know Kingsville is such this vast area we do have the transportation issue so it was a little difficult to try to move students up into uh, from the other schools that border Kingsville in into that area and we did think about that new development um, for Vincent farm so um, we, we do have quite a process ahead of us but just shifting some things right. okay um, is there any other um, any other comments as P as groups have discussed anybody else want to make any other comments um, yes sir oh let's get you a mic over here <laughs> For the for the viewers uh, online, do do they have any maps that represent um, the neighborhoods or communities? So, for example, how you have the boundaries of what's going on by, based off of population, I guess. Are there any any where you could block off for neighborhoods or communities that okay. way? Okay, like a, better um, feel? a subdivision map, maps of subdivision yes. boundaries and things like that. I, I don't know, I don't think we have anything in front of you now, but that's something that I know that there's some data out there, and I'll look at putting together a subdivision map for you so okay. that you could have that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yes, sir. Did you have, oh, we have, okay. We'll get to you next. Um, so to piggyback off of that, we were talking about it, and right within our groups, each of us knows certain areas. So for example, um, one of the areas we were talking about was the retirement home. So even if it's um, a differentiation between residential versus commercial, I think that's also helpful to see, um, just so that we know what we're dealing with. Okay. And then um, another thing as we were talking, because in our group we were like, how do we, you know, just trying to figure out an approach. And so even when you start looking at, oh, if this is a natural boundary and I can move these planning blocks over to another school, I think one of the challenges we're facing is is that four of the most overpopulated schools are right next to each other. That's right. So yeah. you can move from one school to another and you decrease the capacity in one and then add it to the load of another. So I just think that's something to keep in mind as well. That's right, and it's, it's a good observation and you know what we call, it's something that we call the domino effect. In order to, resolve, to help solve the overcrowding at this school, you may have to start all the way on the other side of the, of the study area and move some areas here to give them capacity, move that in. And um, when we get into the next meeting, we're, it, because as you can see, this is a pretty daunting task and there's a lot to consider. We're gonna be coming at the next meeting with uh, a couple of options that we call draft baseline options for you to, to look at and react to. And, not, and everything's gonna be draft, but it's just a couple of options that, that try to accomplish the goals uh, as best as we feel we can from a, from a distance, and then let you react to those. But we're also gonna give you tools that you could create new maps if you want, or modify the ones that we've had, and sort of as from something from a starting point 
that'll, that'll help you kind of hit the ground running when we get into it. But these are all good considerations. Um, this, this landmark map does show residential versus commercial property on it. So this is something that you'll have as a tool to reference. But we'll also be putting together some of the subdivision data and, um, and we'll look at that. We may be able to color code that in specific ways um, as may, maybe uh, residential or multifamily, single multifamily, that kind of stuff. And so I'll, I'll look at that and we'll bring you some subdivision data as well. Yes. Does each school have a magic number? Does, is, are they trying to accomplish, let's say, Kearney Elementary, are they looking to reach a certain amount of numbers, each school? Well, that's a good question. You know, there's always a conversation of, uh, should, is there a target number that we're trying to shoot for? Um, what I usually do when, when, we when I bring you data at the next meeting, you'll see what the, whole, the, the, the study area-wide utilization rate is. Um, even including the new capacity. And I think that's somewhere around 101%. And so something plus or minus, uh, you know, five percentage points off of that, it, it may be a good target. But you really have to look at that, and that's, it, it's, it's, that's a tough, tough question to answer because there is other relief down the road for, for some areas. There's new schools being planned south of here and things like that that, that you, that you may, may want to consider. Um, different factors and things like that. So um, keep that in your mind and then what kind of target was. I always like to start with the district, the study area utilization rate and try to make everything as close to that as possible. But it's, it's not as easy as it, as, as, as it, as you may know, it's, it's, it can be a challenge, but you'll, you'll be able to look and react to some of the maps some maps that we bring at the next meeting so that you can kind of see what it would look like if utilization was was more balanced and, and then you can say okay I don't like this map or start from scratch or maybe make edits to this map and that'll be that'll be sort of pr primarily at the next uh, meeting yes, sir if, uh, I just had a, had a procedural question uh, this is a lot to digest for the first night so if we look through this and see any other like I just noticed a neighborhood that's kind of broken in half Okay. Should we send emails to the study group email to say, hey, PB138 uh, should incorporate this street as well because it's Please. part of, okay. Yes. If you have any comments like that, the boundary study email is that okay. that's the way, that's the vehicle to do that. So any thoughts about that, you can communicate that. We'll share that with the whole committee. But, you know, any thoughts that you have in the meantime, that information, I will, uh, I will take it in and see what, if, if, if we incorporate it at, the, at that next meeting, we may not, we may just have it be a point of discussion for the next, for that meeting, something to build on for the meeting three. But that input is certainly, a, we, we certainly encourage you to study the material in more deep depth, because this is your first time looking at this. And uh, so please do that. And if you have any other feedback, email to that boundary study email, and that's, that's the best way to do that. Okay, and quick. Um, I think someone else had said something similar. Um, it would be really helpful, and you guys can do what you want, and you guys are running it, but uh, if we could have a, a map that's just centered on the new school like, with like a one-mile radius so we can yes. kind of focus just on that school. Because I, be, I think a lot of people, that's probably the starting point of, and you got, I mean, your maps that you give us may comp accomplish that already, but I know for us it was kind of tough because we had these maps that are kind of broken up across right. borders. And yeah, we had this group over here I'd asked that, and, that's, and I have it noted. We okay. will give you a, a vicinity map of that. In addition to this, we're also going to bring you an interactive map that lets you, um, that lets, that's a, a, a web-based map so that you can zoom in on the areas and look at planning blocks and things like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll be presenting that to you at the next meeting as well. In the communities, we have a lot of apartment and condo complexes. How are those numbers calculated into the planning blocks and how does it account for the fluctuation of those uh, um, buildings? Um, the students are all mapped uh, based on where they live, so they have a home address, and that student is plotted on a map. And then, and then we, what the, the mapping system, the GIS map does, is it, it actually counts the number of students that live in that block. And that's what that, that number actually represents students that attend, that live in that planning block, that go to their boundary school. There may be some students in there that go to a school for outside of their area for a special program and we want to make sure we capture that and don't compromise 
um, students, th that, that nature of students transferring in and out for special programs. So our focus is looking at the students that live in each block that go to their boundary school. And, that's, and so even th whether they're in an apartment or whether they're in a house, they're counted and then they're, they're totaled up within that block. And they're, they're, they're this, the, in terms of the transient nature of some communities and things like that, it's just something that, that you have to be mindful of and note as we look at options and look at boundaries, uh, you know, it's, it's something that you c that's notable to say, okay, this area is an area that has fluctuates a lot. So just be mindful as we're working on options, maybe make, do something different if you think it's important beca because of the nature of some of the different communities and how they, 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 they turn over and things like that. Any other, any other questions or thoughts? I think I'm really encouraged by uh, the conversations that you're having and you're working in the groups. I think we're gonna have a really good group to work with on this process. Um, do you want, um, Ms. Calder, wanna make a comment? No, I just wanna tell you what comment Okay. We want to make sure that we capture uh, notes that you have written and things like that. So we do want to make sure that, that that's not something that gets caught in the shuffle and gets put in your binder and that we don't have. So pl if, you, if you have any material that you have noted, please, uh, please Ms. Calder will walk, will walk around and she'll make sure she picks it up just to make sure that we don't miss any input or feedback that you have. I know I saw a couple of groups had questions and things like that um, and markups. So before you leave, make sure that we get uh, all of this, all of this, this information. So, so I really think that this was a, a good meeting tonight, a good kickoff to this process. Uh, we're meeting back again on September 20th at the same place here at 6 p.m. And like I said, at that meeting, I'm gonna, we're going to be bringing you more st uh, a lot of statistics and maps some uh, those draft baseline options for you to start looking at and reacting to more information on capacity and things like that and we'll also follow up to some of the questions that you had and provide some other materials for you but um, I really I really appreciate your time we all really appreciate your time tonight and you guys have a great night and we'll see you here in a couple of weeks okay <laughs>